This is from Angela Olo. Uh, she sent an email yesterday. At the last meeting, my comment was read into the record during the public comment period. I understand that it is board policy to not address public comments during open session. However, how are we to know if the board has considered or is considering the public comments if they are not addressed in open session and no follow-up is conducted? There's nothing more important than the safety of our children. Again, my understanding is that Brentwood School District employs one resource officer for the entire school district. Once the construction at Litzinger and High School is complete, I understand there will be three separate school campuses sharing one resource officer. Are there any plans to hire two additional resource officers or security guards to enable each campus to have its own resource officer or security guard during school hours? If not, why not? If it is not appropriate to address my comment during the meeting, I would greatly appreciate if someone would follow up with me after the meeting. Kay Mason sent my contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. And I can, I can reach out to that community member tomorrow if the board would like. School safety is on our agenda. Yeah, I have a report about it this evening as well. Okay, um, and that's all the comments we have. So, uh, could you call the roll? And then, since our vice president is here, <laughs> she's de dep I think she de deputized me. And so <laughs> you're in charge. You can. I need I need a couple minutes to just kind of. So, if you wouldn't mind continuing, then I can. All right. Well, I'll get her. Uh, go ahead. Call the roll, please. Okay. Jamie Allen. Brian Flynn. Present. Chris Perkins. Here. Keith Gravenberg. Here. Keith Slusser. Here. Lindsay Spencer. Terry Drossel. Here. Make a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. And second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, that brings us to the superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, first off tonight, uh, we have uh, Matt and I uh, with Navigate to give us an update on our construction projects. All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, yeah. Matt. I can't believe it's already been a full summer <coughs> since the last update, but I was here, I think, in May, the end of school year, and I was kicking off the new year. I want to give an opportunity to come give you an update on both the McGrath project and the upcoming Mark Twain uh, rehab project. Start. So, like I said, we'll kickstart with McGrath. I'll give an overall project update. Uh, we'll talk, give you an update on the budget. Uh, look at the current schedule for Mark Twain, uh, where we're at with design, and the plan for bidding and construction. So first off with McGrath, <clears throat> just a couple bullet points on where we're at with some of the site activities. Uh, this will be for exterior and, and site work. Uh, so on the outside of the building, as many of you have probably driven by, we've made a lot of progress with the ma exterior masonry. Uh, brick veneer is nearly complete. They're working right now on the south um, elevation of the gymnasium. They'll grab and turn that east elevation and then they'll be pretty much complete with all masonry work by hopefully the end of this month as long as weather kind of holds out. Uh, the, the shingle roofing is ongoing. Uh, they've stocked, I think, the gymnasium roof uh, yesterday or day before, so they'll they'll be back on there uh, tomorrow to put the shingles up. Uh, we are under, we're, we're in the dry. This will be just that, that cover, you know, layer of shingles on the top. Um, architectural sheet metal and EFIS work, this is uh, continuing and should be wrapped up uh, at the end of this month. So a lot of your downspouts, uh, coping you know, covers, any of that uh, metal work. Uh, windows have started in being installed this last month. Uh, they are working their way around the building, uh, trying to get the rest of it dried in. Uh, some of the storefront areas around the stairwells uh, will take them a little bit more time, but uh, they should also be wrapping that up this month. Um, big milestones the last 
few weeks have been all of our utilities to the building are now uh, hot. So our, our big one was the permanent power. Ameren got us uh, the, the permanent service just two weeks ago. Uh, so we have power to the building. We're going to be starting uh, to run some of the rooftop equipment so we can acclimate the building and get more of the finishes going on the inside. Uh, the water is now turned on, flushed, and brought to the building. Uh, our gas utilities, Spire connected the gas meter last week, uh, so we're, we're hot with all the main uh, utilities. Uh, we do have charter lined up to uh, start with their work, and that will more or less tie towards the end of the project so we can get the uh, IT infrastructure. Uh, Site-wise, we are going to be starting grading on the north elevation and really the bulk of that parking lot um, on the north side. So that will start uh, this week, next week, and we'll start getting some more paving going uh, so that we can have our, our, our parking lot. So just a couple pictures of the outside. So this is that, that main entrance on the northeast corner. Uh, so you can see that brickwork on the you know, that bottom band is, 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 is complete all the way around the building, uh, except over to the uh, gymnasium side, which is on the back side of this. Uh, the EFIS up top, and then you got your uh, split face uh, CMU around that entrance way there. And the guys on the lift are putting in the curtain wall uh, entrance, uh, that aluminum storefront mm -hmm. in this picture. So, uh, some of the grading that's going to happen will be where you see just the rock there, that's that's what's going to happen next. It's getting a lot of that grading completed and paving uh, going here in the next month or so. Uh, this is that uh, courtyard right in between the two wings. Uh, just showing you some of the progress there. Uh, just starting on the roofs, you can see that white is just the underlayment. That's the waterproofing membrane. Uh, they'll be putting shingles down. It'll look more like a, like a house roof shingle. Uh, they'll be installing that. Uh, all of our other uh, flat roofs are 100% complete. Um, you can see we have downspouts tied into uh, the underground storm detention, which is kind of hard to believe, but back when we were doing all the early site work, this is the area where there's 60 inch pipes underground that we probably showed you guys right in this courtyard space, so right underneath the site there is where this underground detention <coughs> basin is, is located. So kind of cool to, to see that and then eventually, probably in another month, we'll have the paving down, uh, which will uh, be the groundwork for the playground. But some of the interior work that's been going on uh, over the summer, we have, like I said, started up our some of our rooftop equipment, getting the HVAC systems going so that we can climatize that building and get finished painting. Uh, a lot of your work, woodwork, casework started. Uh, so that's going to be starting here uh, very soon. Uh, MEPFP uh, finishes. So this is all your mechanical, electrical uh, trim out. Uh, framing drywall insulation is wrapping up in the administration wing, so that kind of area C, we call it, right where all the administration offices are. Uh, so there's just a little bit more drywall work to be completed. <clears throat> Some of the finished painting that continues, uh, we have flooring starting. Uh, I think we have a mock-up of the stained concrete in another week. Uh, some of the wall tile in the bathrooms has already started. Uh, we've already started hanging ceiling grid. Uh, in a lot of the ECC, and that will continue over to the uh, elementary side as well. Uh, the gymnasium, we've started installing or wrapping up the acoustical panels, and then that will all get painted. Uh, and then they'll bring in all the bleachers and uh, the rest of the uh, equipment in the gymnasium. Uh, then we'll continue into hanging wood doors and casework, which should start later this month, probably acclimating that material once it's loaded to the site. Uh, so a lot of a lot of finishes are, are starting to get underway, which was a, a big uh, successor to
to actually getting the permanent power uh, turned on. So that was, that's a big, big milestone this summer. Uh, just some of the photos on the inside. So this is one of the classrooms in the ECC, just to show kind of the level of finishes that are starting to happen with the ceilings. Uh, we got the grid, grid in there. Some of the lights have been installed. Uh, we'll start trimming out some of the uh, wall fixtures, and then we'll be uh, putting in the flooring. Uh, so this is that Clara Story area, just over the library quarter. So it just shows you kind of where we're at insulation. We have windows installed. Uh, they'll be hanging drywall in there. Uh, this is probably one of the last areas to uh, get drywall uh, finished, but kind of this will be a kind of a cool shot. You know, once you get once you, once you get this finished up. Uh, this is the actual library itself. Uh, we still need to get those windows in on that. That west side there, we have some just plastic up just so it keeps any weather out. Uh, this is the gymnasium, so you can see where we're at with the acoustical panels. Uh, they're pretty well uh, wrapped up probably this week with hanging those acoustical panels. Uh, then the, the painter will get in there and start painting. Once, once we do have the HVC run in there, we'll be able to put the wood floor in uh, for that, that basketball floor. Uh, this is just a shot of the switch gear, the permanent switch gear, which is uh, now now hot, which is our, our big milestone just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we can now turn rooftop units. Actually, they've been starting those up. I got a text from Andrew Hardnett that yesterday he was all excited about having a Startup guy on site, you know, getting some of those started up. So he's, he's excited. Uh, some of the project, uh, just <coughs> overall uh, updates on completion and just move in. Uh, so we are still on target for the end of October for substantial completion. That will <coughs> you know, kind of kick off a you know partial you know move with punch list. We'll have a, probably a month of getting punch list items addressed. Final cleaning, you know that that sort of thing. So we're at the final completion end of November. Um, I incorporated here some of the other ancillary activities that will happen after that, you know, final completion. So uh, we do we will have like a lot of owner training for some of the facility folks, um, and also the administration folks uh, on all the systems in the building. Um, a lot of the you know, intercom, PA, security systems as well. Uh, furniture installation, we have scheduled for this first part of January. Uh, that'll probably be a two to three week uh, time frame where furniture will uh, be installed in the building. <coughs> um, I have facilities and security, so that's just, like I said, with acclimating uh, facilities, getting all the security systems you know, up and running. I think Andy was talking about Know, having all of his key fobs, he's got a you know, program and that just that kind of detail. Uh, some of the IT infrastructure, uh, December, January. Uh, so we have been in communication, working on a, a move-in plan with Sean Parker, uh, the, the district's IT director, um, and Andrew Hardnett. So once you know we establish a final completion, then Sean can kind of move in, start setting up his his IT and servers and all his uh, his stuff. So that we've kind of got that penciled in December, January. Uh, building uh, final clean uh, after like furniture is, is installed and punched. Uh, we've got that slated in you know, February. Uh, building internet activated. So I, I just threw this in there because talking to Sean, uh, the existing McGrath. I guess it doesn't get shut down until July first. So uh, it'll we'll have a we'll have the new McGrath and then and the existing McGrath online for internet. We'll have the server the servers and everything online sooner than that, but he said it won't be till July before like Wi Fi and internet but <coughs> established. And then that would just allow you know staff to move uh, the summer of uh, twenty three and that whole transition with, with Mark 
one of our, you know, we, we've had, I know the board has as well, has had some questions about would there be any possibility of of moving in perhaps a, at the semester and the, the, the IT piece of that is, is one of the prime considerations. We've had uh, components of, you know, the server and, and working with, with Charter on the, um, on the internet access and there is, you know, some concern that uh, we'll definitely have it done by July of 23, but uh, the lead time all the supply chain issues on the uh, infra IT infrastructure is multiple months out. So Sean has been working on this already for several months and getting orders in, but they're still showing some indeterminate lead times on some of those. Yeah, so I think he was saying on his his switches, which go in the IT racks, those alone are like a nine month lead time. supply chain issues and just some of the longer lead stuff that he's, he's having to deal with. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely a major component of you know, your communications within the building. Well, we have two servers, like the one that's already at McGrath and then a server for the new McGrath so that when we bring over Mark Twain, we will be able to support that volume of internet capabilities for McGrath and Mark Twain? Yeah, we'll have full <coughs> capabilities for both buildings. Yeah, and, I, and that has been a part of Sean's you know, master you know, plan and talking about how that transition and keeping the old McGrath live because at first Charter was not aware that it was staying. <laughs> so we, we had to keep reiterating that, no, this is actually staying for another, another year while well, folks over so we'll have two buildings here live. Uh, so that's that's all part of the discussion. Any uh, questions for Matt on the on the timeline before he moves on from that? I, I still have my navigate hard hat so yeah, 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 yeah. I would yeah I'd be more than happy to give you guys a tour. We can set up a <coughs> time that works if we want to do it you know after hours again like we did the last one uh, that'd be fine I get where to set up that sounds great yeah, yeah maybe we look a couple weeks out or something yeah, yeah that sounds great with all the work that's going on down there and the construction and grading were there any issues with all that heavy rain of any runoff into the neighborhood yeah so we did have one of the neighbors uh, on Stratford Lane three houses in on Stratford they came on to site to try to talk to the contractor about potential issues they were having with some water getting into their basement. <coughs> um, right now it is into the contractor's insurance uh, to go to the next steps, you know, see, I mean, it, it's really unclear. I mean, they're pointing the finger at our job site. There's also an easement that goes right between the job site and those houses that's kind of a city own stuff um, but as far as you know clearly the fall I mean we, like you said we had a oh, yeah. very very heavy rain um, we had you know the good thing is uh, with us starting to put the final you know, grading and all the pavement down in the next month you know anything that could be on site is going to be directed towards an area drain that goes underground um, I think it was a matter of maybe a culmination of both that and just water coming from uphill and found, found its way, unfortunately. Uh, but th yeah, that was really the only you know, major impact from those rain events. Which and she's, she's working with the insurance for ICS and Andy Hartnett has reached out to her personally a, a couple times since we always want to try to be good neighbors for these situations and help facilitate that process however it resolves. As we had some issue down there in the years ago. I think there was a was it a storm sewer inlet that was plugged up and somebody got water. I, I don't remember specifics, but this has come up before. I kind of hope that with all the huge drainage pipes they put in that this yeah. would not be an issue. <coughs> yeah, like I said, that whole north side right now we're just 
show and actually tying those in. So any additional runoff would just be, you know, what would potentially be coming down through that easement. There's yeah. a, there's some telephone poles between there. Uh, I think MSD was also contacted because there's a looks like a sinkhole that would have could have been an old storm line inlet that you know, was kind of caved in. Uh, so I think we were talking to one of the neighbors and they had contacted MSD about coming to look at that too. So on their property or on the school's uh, property? It's it's in that uh, alleyway between Stratford and the mm -hmm. school property. And you know, my understanding is this, that's the city you know, owned property right there. So. You know, MSD, my, my understanding there is a sanitary storm line underneath there, which is, I think, a combination of sanitary and storm. Um, apparently, the sinkhole kind of helped the neighbor because a lot of the water that was coming down ended up going into there you know, before it, it got cut off before it went to their driveway. So. Um, Matt, uh, when we had a meeting at Navigate like two months ago, there was concern on the wall. You guys were going to be shooting it and coming, that seeing whether or not. Yeah. So the no, on the oh. south side, so the wall, but hey, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, the south side of the side along Ritzinger Road, um, there's a there's the existing retaining wall that has all the you know painting on it. Um, that wall we've been shooting because there was concern about the sidewalk, the sidewalk settling. We shot it for two months. It, it is. It ended up settling about an inch and a quarter uh, total. Uh, we had our geotech engineer you know, take a look at it. He said it's not totally uncommon, but there's something going on that appears to be some you know, water that's getting under the the sidewalk along Litzinger Road because it, it's clearly undermining the sidewalk, and then it's a, it's impacting that. That retaining wall. So we have had conversations with the city. We had public works out there two weeks ago, and they were going to look at possibly raising the curb because that curb is a real shallow curb. So when we had that heavy rain, me and Andy Hartman were out there in the rain, just kind of observing the runoff. And sure enough, there was, it was overtopping the curb a little bit, hmm. going onto the sidewalk, and then of course it's going to find its least pass so it was running down behind the retaining wall so uh, some of the measures we've taken um, besides reaching out to the city and they're looking into what to do with the curb they're also looking into raising that sidewalk um, so that it pitches back towards the street instead of you know towards the retaining wall uh, we've also um, in installed some self-leveling uh, sealant in that crack along the sidewalk and the retaining wall to help if there is any water that you know sheds over the sidewalk at least goes over the wall and not behind it uh, so we still have, I haven't heard anything from the city uh, since then but I know they're you know, taking taking it you know to their powers to be and in the meantime we're trying to you know address the water that does get there so we don't think we're going to have to tap into the content you know when we were meeting we were thinking that was going to be like the last kind of Potential major <coughs> contingency item, so the right. one and a half inch settling. We don't believe it's going it's to cause us to. Yeah, have to I mean, where it is right much. now, if we can, if we can, you know, have some help with the city with the sidewalk, and eventually, maybe it's not by the end of the year, but by next year they raise that curb, which I think they've had issues with people hitting those street lights, so they kind of would like to raise the curb, so mm -hmm. it's a, not as easy to get to. Uh, that'll really help. Continue to monitor. I think we're going to still shoot it every every month for the next couple of months just to see if there's you know, any more additional settling. That's that's where we're that's where we're at um, at the moment. Do we have any date or time or um, any time plan for the staff to go through? Have they seen any of it? Oh, since like a tour or something? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if. if He's taken, I think Andy kind of takes, you know, a few people around, but I mean, we've yeah, we haven't done an that. official, um, but we, yeah, we can take just maybe once we get all the, the windows in, you know.
know, maybe that would be something to do before their PTO meeting or whatever, just so that they feel that they're, you know. Kind of just seeing the right. future home. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, pretty soon we could go have them go through without all the hard hats and everything, couldn't we? Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's as long as we're not there active during, you know, the, them banging around and stuff, we should be able to. Yeah, it's a great idea. We absolutely will. We don't have anything on the calendar, but but yeah, we'll do the full, you know, ribbon cut and open house. People walk through the room and see everything. Absolutely. Yeah, fun back to school events. <laughs> Can we have the cleaning after people tear the place up? <laughs> Make them all take their shoes off before they go in or have <laughs> yeah. a budget for plastic booties on there. Questions on kind of the, uh, look at the current uh, projected costs, you know, to completion. So last the last time we met in May, uh, just for comparison's sake, the, the bottom line number there for the projected cost I think is down twenty five hundred dollars. That does still have a hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars in contingency, just in case we do have. Some unforeseen that pop up through their head, but uh, that's that's where we're where we're still at there. Um, so you know, still still able to move all, you know a good amount of that contingency over to the Mark Twain project, and anything that is left over obviously will also. Just a quick question, clarifying um, the technology piece. Is that also including the IT? The infra is that all yeah. the infrastructure costs yes. there? Yes, exactly. So this is like the switches I was talking yeah. about. You know, any kind of wireless access points. Anything that Sean doesn't have on his you know, overall budget that's McGrath specific um, okay. is kind of covered in those. And strictly infrastructure, we're obviously yeah. through the technology budget. Well, right. Also have actual hardware and so forth that, that yeah. far exceeds that. I was, that's part of our normal budget. Yeah, so. I think like smart. It is okay. Yeah, like yeah. smart boards and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. I think are outside of. Okay. Uh, outside All right. Of yeah, but we've Thank already you. accounted for that. You did. Okay. Okay. Great. So Matt, there's quite a the, for the furniture fixtures and equipment. Did we just need less furniture, or did we come up with some better ideas for? Uh, yeah, so, you know, big part of that we we were um, under our furniture budget quite a bit um, on this on this project when we had originally staffed it was somewhere between ninety and a hundred thousand and uh, crunch the numbers mm -hmm. again, but yeah, so yeah, you know, the projected cost. I mean, we worked closely with. Color art, and uh, you know, by the timing of what we were able to do, we kind of got in before additional increases because they were predicting an additional, you know, twelve to fifteen percent. But we were able to to get our orders in prior to that additional, so that was a basically a nice savings. Mm -hmm. But you know, we got exactly what we wanted to get in terms of the furniture. So, um, and as always, we were kind of, you know trying to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money and going through and when they're comparable quality furniture, um, you know, that would perhaps be a lesser price. We were opting for some of that, but um, we, we got everything has, you know, 10 plus year warranties, really good stuff. Great. Any other budget questions? Uh, so update on Mark Twain. So we are through our DD. We're uh, the HCK uh, is currently wrapping up the uh, CDs so the construction documents, which will be the bid documents that go out, uh, targeting the middle of September to have those wrapped up. Then we'll go through a round of uh, constructability reviews. Uh, that's something that Navigate does. So we'll we'll look at the drawings, you know, just for a you know, standpoint of if we're going to bid it out, if we see any discrepancies, we'll go through that with them. Uh, and then the plan is to go out to bid in November uh, with a bid date in early or mid-December mid you know, before the holidays uh, with still maintaining that construction start date of May of the following year, which will <coughs> more
has to be dependent on the timing of move out and abatement because uh, we will have some abatement, but the plan is still you know summer 23 to summer 24 uh, before the construction is complete. Um, are we going to try to maybe head it in to December, like the bid date? I know when we talked earlier about trying to you know get it in so we can have a board meeting instead of you know if we wait till the end of January to approve the person, it could cost some delay. I mean. I know we're, we're pushing, we push the bid date out in hopes that we could get some more people in. Right. I guess I just want to make sure that if we're going to be voting on something, you know, we can have something in December for the December meeting if we have it, it'd be much better to, to give yeah. people six months of lead time instead of five months of lead time to start prepping. Yeah, no, I mean, that, I think we have it set up to, it's like the 15th, I think, mm -hmm. of December, so. Yeah, I think we worked backwards from the December board meeting. Okay. Yeah, I'm just looking at the count. Yeah, the Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So I mean, it, it gives us uh, we get bids in. We can get the you know top two three contractors in. We'll interview them, um, do some background you know checks, and then come to the board meeting with a recommendation. It's five days enough time for you guys to do all that, or? Yeah, it's it's tight, but you know we can make it. We can always have a special meeting if it's necessary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the a little, yeah, a little later yeah. <laughs> in December, a little later in December, yeah. the 23rd. The 23rd. Yeah. 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 Get the people who are really interested. Let us know what yeah. you need, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and speaking to that, you know, why we pushed it yeah. back a couple months, you know, I think initially we were more in line with this timeline before all the crazy, you know, material and escalations and supply chain. Then we kind of moved it up to September. Now we've decided a good strategy would be, hey, let's let inflation come down a little bit, let, the, let more GCs come off the summer, you know, really get eager for their backlog of work for 2023. So if we can maybe make two of those, both of those work in our advantage, I think that'll help with both bidder turnout and you know, hopefully some cost you know, savings. Uh, that was the reason why we moved it from the September to November. Uh, you know, bid, bid going out to bid. Uh, so, you know, that still gives us, like you said, six months before construction actually starts for getting a head start on procurement. Yeah, I mean, because the biggest concern, obviously, is just material. You know, like right. if we're having this much trouble now getting IT stuff. The last thing I want is for Mark Twain to not be ready. Yeah. And he's moved that, into the other building because now, you know, right. two yeah. years on that site, and it just, or we're moving them in the middle of the semester, which I wouldn't, you know, I couldn't even fathom that either. So I just want to make sure that we're giving everyone as much time and lead time as possible to make sure that they are successful. Well, and I mean, that's what you guys are hired for. To that point, uh, I hope uh, you have what's your level of confidence that. We'll get that Mark Twain all done in one year without some huge surprise coming out of some wall somewhere. Yeah, I mean it's so refreshing yeah. when you report on the McGrath <laughs> building because everything's on time, it's in the budget, yeah. and that's the only time that's ever happened to us. Other than this building, where we got lucky because there was a recession and everybody wanted to bid on it. But, but what? It's a loaded question. Sure. It's yeah, I mean of course there could be something. You know, you know one thing that could refresh you a little bit. It's just the amount of time that I know HCK has taken scouting that building out. They, right. I think it was last week or week before, the structural engineer spent a whole day or half a day uh, just combing through attic spaces and you know, finding where some of those load bearing walls are, or some of the columns, so that we don't have you know some of that unforeseen. Uh, about a month ago, we had an excavating company come out and expose some of the footings where we're going to have the new addition up on just to, just so we knew exactly where the footings were um, you know how we're going to tie in the new building um, you know some of those surprises we don't want to have when we start digging into the, right. the ground um, so there has been a you know pretty good amount of effort ahead of time yeah we're going to have some surprises along the way that we feel that you know, 12 to 13 months you know, is, is more than enough time to you know, allow a GC to 
strip it down and try to uncover any of those you know, loose ends that we might have found early in the, in the process. Um, that will be the, the hope is we can identify that early. Do we know where all the asbestos abatement will have to happen? Yeah, we have, we have a, a full asbestos survey that's been conducted and actually I'm going to be reaching out here in the next month or two to start a RFP process for for that to get abatement contractors lined up so that you know come May whenever the school ends we have them get in there right away right. you know start taking all that stuff out you know have a monitor you know monitor a monitoring company will be there you know, while they're doing that work uh, and the kind the GC will get right in behind. Yeah, so we have a report that identifies exactly what materials are, are hot that need to be abated before. Uh, yes, sir. Found all the chimneys in the building? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope we have. <laughs> okay. Any skeletons? Yeah. <laughs> Tunnels, you know, chimneys. It wasn't on the board. It's not funny to me. Thank you.
crisis team uh, that has multiple members on it, uh, including people such as our school resource officer, nurses, administrator, uh, teachers, um, and uh, they do, those plans are all submitted to me on a yearly basis, updated, submitted to me, I review those, um, and so I will be doing that, I'm in the process of that, and uh, we'll also be meeting with those teams as well. Uh, a few additional um, pieces, we did uh, see the need for some additional uh, high quality uh, walkie talkies. Um, we already have several, but we wanted to further that communication in a, any kind of a crisis type situation. So uh, we did purchase several for each school in the district in order to give those to key personnel and to have those situated throughout the buildings. Um, one additional thing is, this was actually, I started this, uh, we, this was part of a training that we did a couple of years ago, a recommendation that you, know, you would have magnetic strips on every classroom door and that what that allows us to do is in a lockdown situation instead of um, you know fumbling with keys or even deadlocks you uh, simply pull off a strip on the door and the door's already locked it closes very quickly um, so we did purchase some additional of those so that uh, every door in the district every interior classroom door will have that on that i've been distributing those this week um, we have blackout shades for all interior classroom side lights the small windows and the doors so in the case of a uh, lockdown uh, procedure um, you're able to just pull the strip of velcro off that those go down you turn off the lights and you can't tell if anyone uh, is in the room uh, door alarms we uh, installed these last year at the middle school high school and this summer we have added them uh, to the elementary schools and basically uh, anytime uh, a door that's not any of the doors besides the main door the only entrance into the building if those are ever uh, open from the inside uh, or someone attempts to from the outside that sets those alarms off and um, alerts us to uh, situations so it you know, the main point to that is, you know, we get concerned that kids might let somebody into the building uh, without thinking about it or knowing. They're generally very good about that, but these alarms are just one additional step in that. Um, in the next, uh, we've been working on this all summer, and the timeline is uh, within the next uh, three weeks, we will have uh, panic buttons installed at every uh, secretary's desk in all of the main offices and those are linked uh, right to police dispatch so similar to what you see in a bank type situation where um, you know because one thing we need to keep in mind that the more likely scenario um, than the ones that make the news are could often just be a, a disgruntled a person coming into the building or a situation where you know that secretary or administrator doesn't feel safe in that situation so that instead of having to engage or obviously pick up a phone and call 911 which could further uh, exacerbate the situation they can press the panic button and then we're also uh, working on signage throughout our buildings that will identify uh, by color coding. Um, and what this will allow us to do is in working, this has been conversations with the police and our, our local police and fire department, that while they have you know, the, uh, the blueprints of our buildings and so forth, obviously in an emergency situation that can be a very confusing uh, thing to be like, hey, there, you know, we need you in room 221, and trying to tell them where that is. Well, by color coding it, um, we can say go to Red Wing, and you know, building B, Red Wing, and they can head right there, and we'll of course have that all mapped out for them um, once we have that in place. So that's a that's a project we're excited about, and we have in place right now. And the other 
piece that I talked to the staff a lot about yesterday is while um, outside situations um, get a lot of the news press, um, our, our real advantage as a district is a lot of these situations that they're dealing with are, you know, over 90% are current or former students. Um, so our advantage as a district is the fact that we do personally know every student and we work really hard to get to know them and their family and you know identify and help them with other situations so that is how I truly think well I, I certainly you know endorse everything that we've continue to do with these types of hardware improvements and pro processes and protocols. I think that's really how you keep a school district um, safe is by working with the emotional health of, of your students. Um, and I think that's really where we excel. So that's gonna continue to be our focus is on supporting the mental health of, of our students in the district. Any questions about our safety? Update. I just have one, just because there have been some changes since last year. Is it communicating this out to students, or maybe having an early in the school year intruder drill? Just so our elementary kids know not to open the door. They're going to set off an alarm just for their information. But then also to students in all of our schools to not prop doors open or those sorts of things, because that's important to communicate as well. <laughs> yeah, great point. I will reinforce that with our principals to share all this with the uh, students as well. I just had a question on the magnetic strips. I guess I'm not familiar with them at all. Would it be possible for a kid that's being a little bit rambunctious when the teacher leaves the room to pull the strip down, slam the door shut, and then they're trapped inside the room? And Like how do you undo this magnetic lock on the, you know, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how to, if you can't get in, for, obviously it's to keep people from getting in. So is there a way to, like, un, like how does it work? I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah unmagnetic, you know. <laughs> Basically, all the, magnet, all the magnetic strips do is they keep the door from fully being able to lock and close. So okay. if you pull it off in an emergency or yeah. if it a rambunctious <laughs> child yeah. wanted to do that, it would, the door would lock, but we have master keys. Um, okay. We have literally our keys, you know, open every classroom door from the inside or the out so we would be able to very quickly get into that room it's a good question and then i guess do the walkie talkies work across the district are there channels on them that if something's happening at mark twain that it instantly goes over the walkie talkie to the other school and it's not a phone call or is it only building related walkie talkie I mean, well, you said they're high powered, high, you know, high cost. I didn't know. Yeah, they are. They're high cost, high powered. They have their own, you know, their own uh, frequency. So we'll have to test them to see. Um, but previous ones were we've been able to, we've been able to do from from the entire district because we're not spread that far, obviously. So yeah, yeah we have, and we'll, you know, we'll we have different channels for different. in my head. If something's going on at one of the schools, you'd like mm -hmm. to quickly relay it to, and not have to be a phone call. Mm -hmm. Hey, by the way, exactly. you could use for that. We, we had that extra yeah, some kids, yeah. Eating that question from the public about is one resource officer enough? And uh, it seems to me it should be, but what's the accepted wisdom now about that in school districts? Do they try to have one at every school? Or I'm not aware of any school that that has a, a school resource officer at, at every single school. Everyone that, that I network with, which is all St. Louis and St. Charles County, um, we have a really, would, we would have one of the lower pupil to SRO ratios since we have less than 800 right. students in the district. We're all, you know, the, as you know, the entirety of Brentwood is less, you know, slightly over two miles. Um, so for us, I, I feel that Officer Figs, and he does a really, I, I think most of the parents would say that they frequently see him around. He makes his way to the Early Childhood Center. I always see him out at the elementary, so um, he doesn't, intentionally doesn't have a formal, formal 
schedule, but he's very visible around the district. So, um, can there it, you're probably playing? Is there something going to be reported out to the parents and such about these new safety things, and maybe something about that can be mentioned that we have this resource officer and it seems to be staffed well for all these reasons. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, we can do a, a safety update, but I'll take some key talking points off of this and mention that. I mean, it's, it's a big deal in everybody's mind, and so I think the more reassurances mm -hmm. they get, it's probably good. Well, I think the panic buttons being added, I think, are a good thing. Yeah. You know, so right there, you've got, you know, you've got immediate access to the, the police, you know, with those now. So. And then how often do police officers besides Officer Figs go through our buildings? Are they familiar? Several police officers are familiar with the layout of our buildings, I assume. Yeah, they, they've, uh, they've walked our buildings. They, they, know the, they know the layouts. They're very, they're great about just coming by, <coughs> popping in. Mm -hmm. So we have a great relation, you know, we have a really great relationship with the Brentwood uh, Police Department. Can we touch base with them again and just reiterate school starting and you know can they start doing their little drive-bys in the mornings and in the afternoons at pick up and drop off? Because that's also a huge thing when sometimes traffic gets a little bit hectic and parents get a little upset. You know, the more the the police presence is is around, I think it kind of lowers the um, attitudes. Mm -hmm. So especially on rainy days when traffic is really, really bad and things like that. Just say, hey, just want to reiterate, we loved your support last year. Would love that again during pickup, drop off, and weather permitting. Absolutely. All right, anything else? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, we have summer school recap with Lori Regent. Alex Trepammer. <laughs> 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 all areas of the curriculum. 
We also were able to have two teachers provide in-person support for kids who needed that, and, and they came in. The kids came in, and the teachers there gave them as much support as they needed. So um, it was pretty successful all in all at the middle and high school. Um, and our really exciting thing we want to share with you is the elementary summer school. And Lori's going to talk about that. Uh, the big, the big okay. All right, so we have three uh, summer school programs at the elementary level. We have a jumpstart to kindergarten, which is for our incoming kindergarten students. Those are selected from um, our early childhood program through parents as teachers and also through the kindergarten screening readiness. And we um, have people that we like to invite for that. So that is actually a week longer than the other two camps. Um, just because we like to get the little ones, have them a week to go to the big kids' school before the big kids actually come. So that um, was a week longer than the other two. The STEAM camp is our completely enrichment only. The STEAM activities, um, and it was grades first through sixth grade, incoming first grade through incoming sixth grade. Again, project-based learning, and it lasted from eight to 12, and we provided snacks for all of the um, camps as well. And Camp Learn is our more traditional summer school program where we give students academic support. We designate an hour for math and an, uh, an hour for English language arts. And the teachers really do work individually, small groups, the students really get what they need. Our SSD, Dr. Tra um, Hustetler does an amazing job of supporting our students with SSD staff through both STEAM camp and Learn camp. So really our students are getting so many wonderful enrichment and learning experiences through SSD and through our staff as well. Um, this is just a little bit of, so you can see that we are growing. This was last year and this year. Um, Jumpstart was a little bit lower this year, but I know we had more families that we offered the program to, but because of childcare or vacation schedules, whatnot, the number was a little bit lower this year. Our STEAM camp was up to almost 100 students. We added a se another section, um, another teacher for that because we did have an increased enrollment. <coughs> and I'm actually very proud to see that our camp learn, that more traditional summer school, also grew by a significant amount of students. So that means that we're reaching those students that need that extra support. We're really providing that for them. So you can see the numbers there. Um, and then I just wanted to See, share with you what parents are really happy with this program, along with some of these great, amazing activities that you see. We had almost, we had over 93% of parents, and this was, um, I had 50 respondents, and I probably had about 85 parents, 85 families, so a really good selectorate of, um, for this survey. So the, Everybody seems very pleased, and you can see, they're building, they're having fun. The, the boys down there, that was part of the thing where they had a bottle rocket, and they had an egg inside of it, and they had to create a parachuter mechanism where that egg would not crack, and their egg didn't crack. So really doing some exciting things. You can see they had to um, create a tower that would hold like a can, of, a two pound can in one of those things. Um, and again, the parents were satisfied with the STEAM camp and their activities for their children. You can't get much better than 98%. So um, we had this year something new. It was a project presentation day. So our students from STEAM and LEARN, because the LEARN students also have an hour of STEAM time um, incorporated into their day. They had a kind of a quasi-science fair, kind of share a project with the parents. Um, on the final day of the camp. So to me, I am very proud that the Camp Learn children are able to participate in this. And one of the things that Dr. Trevor and I are very intentional about was making sure that our Camp Learn students are doing the same fun things that the STEAM camp students are so they don't feel that coming to Camp Learn is not fun, it's a chore, but something that they want to do. We made sure that recesses were at the same time as their peers and things like that. So we really wanted it to be a cohesive um, environment for them. And this science fair, we had over 115 adults come, and we had 152 students throughout all three camps. And the Jumpstart to Kindergarten didn't perform, um, have a presentation because little five-year-old was kind of hard to have a big project to share. But that is, just goes to show this wonderful support for these programs that we have.
some of the things, but the reason why everybody's so satisfied is because our staff is so great. This year, last year I thought we had a great staff, and I was like, oh, we're never going to get this good of a staff. And then all of a sudden, we got <coughs> staff members that knocked it out of the park. I have um, it's one staff member who is a teacher in a different school district during the school year, and she told me, she's like, I am having so much fun, I'm going to tell all my friends to come, so hopefully we can get some really great people. And the teachers um, were just saying, this is truly what teaching is meant to be, the kids are excited about learning, we're teaching them fun concepts, and even though the STEAM camp is enrichment, they're still doing math, they're still doing reading. I mean, every time I go in there, they're incorporating those special subjects. They're like sneaking it in, so to speak, <laughs> instead of making it more overt. So that is what I have about that. If you have any questions. Do we provide transportation, or is transportation provided for this program during the summer, or for, not? Well, for, for students who are in the BIC program, we <coughs> provide transportation for them. Yes. And then, so I loved your presentation. I think all of this sounds so exciting. Um, for Camp Learn, those are the students that are invited to mm -hmm. participate. So I, I'm just curious of how many students you invited. We had 46 participate. Is that the majority of students that were invited? We only had, out of the students that were invited, I think we only had four students that didn't wow. come. So, and I work with the classroom teachers to, uh, to kind of let them think about who they would like to have get that extra support. And usually during the spring conference is when the talk about this mm -hmm. and um, and I very and because again because of that integration mm -hmm. with the, the steam camp it feels I feel like the kids are excited to come they just have a different teacher right. they bring just a different teacher for camp so yeah and that I mean you talked to us last year about that or maybe leading up into summer camp you want it to be so inclusive and everyone feels like they're going to a fun camp and right. clearly that seems to be how the students feel and the parents I, I feel like the parents feel that and the kids feel that too. Mm -hmm. They're excited to come. Um, I know I, I love it when I get emails from the parents like, my kids have had a blast this entire time. You, you. So it makes me feel good, but mm -hmm. just to know that the kids are engaged and learning and having fun and growing um, is really something special. So that's great. Lori, my first grader attended Camp Learn and absolutely loved it. So kudos to you and the other mm -hmm. teachers. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. That's so great. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, would you turn on the lights? That's really awesome. Yeah, I, I think that's a real point of pride for the for the school district. I don't know of any other district that has thirty something plus percent of their <laughs> kids coming to a to a summer. To, right. to a summer program. That's Maybe that's a school it's board it's conference um, thing that presentation, presentation <laughs> that we could really, yeah. you know, we were talking about trying to do something that would get our district name out there and just mm -hmm. to toot our horns and maybe you'd be interested in helping us, you know, try and, you know, show other districts what we're doing. I don't want other districts to see uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is keep region. I'm, I'm feeling like I got her for borrowed time. It's a, it's a good point, though, Gary. I, it is something no, that is very, you know, very unique to our district right now. Thank you for giving up your summer because I do know that yes. you have several kids and, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, it's, it's fun for me that the kids want to come and just to see the students and their faces. It is close to 35% of all elementary kids are, are attending summer school, which, you know, we're providing this snack, we're providing this for free for them, so that's a huge draw as well, and it's, I mean, we can't beat it. The presentation today, there was a ton of parents there. It was packed. Will you let us know when that is next year? So yeah. that we can come sure. and, and, and see that? Invite you to that presentation day. That'd be great. Yeah, I, that cool. was Dr. Lane and Dr. Trippier were came, and Did they behave themselves? <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't do any of the experiments. But <laughs> breaking the egg, Keith. Yeah. It was hard. <laughs> so hard. <laughs> All right. Thank you both. Uh, next up, we have our yearly assurance agreement with Special School District that uh, we will, of course, continue to work closely with. 
with them. <clears throat> Anything additional, Trevenia, to say about that? We were the first one to have it back. What she said? We were the first, first one to have it back. Okay. So we need a motion to approve. Motion to approve the SSD assurance statement for fiscal year 2022-2023. Second. Right. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, Alex, would you speak briefly to the uh, St. Louis virtual campus yeah. program since you've been going to those meetings for a while for us? So the, um, there's been a, a local effort amongst all the um, St. Louis County school districts to um, put together a virtual, what they're calling the virtual academy. And it's, it's really um, a, an exciting program that will kind of, um, I hate to say it this way, but it'll be a competitor to Springfield launches kind of online platform. And so uh, this year is the first year that it will be officially up and running, provided that we participate in that, um, or become a member of that of that virtual academy kind of uh, consortium. This year it's focused on elementary, um, elementary only. So if a child wants to, or if a school district feels that it, you know they need to place a child in a virtual setting, uh, it would be another option. We have launch as an option. <coughs> And now we would have the, the virtual the St. Louis Virtual Academy. Next school year, not this school year, but the following school year, they'll start introducing more secondary courses. And I think the idea is that it'll be a slow build over time. And uh, the advantage, you know, one advantage you could look at it from uh, the versus launch is that these are local teachers. Uh, Parkway School District is going to be the fiscal agent. So the teachers that are all presenting this uh, curriculum and material are St. Louis County teachers. They're, um, you know, and we all kind of work together through our curriculum organizations or whatnot, so we're, we're kind of in lockstep. Uh, so we feel a little better about delivering or providing a local uh, teacher to uh, St. Louis County residents anyway. And then at the high school level, um, again, that's just, it's another option for us to use versus launch. And again, it's, it's local. Um, there are, they are talking about the elementary piece, I should back up, to being more, um, of a hybrid of synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, it's not really that way right now with Springfield Launch, so kind of feel like this elementary program, although we don't have any children right now in Brentwood, but if we ever had to, um, if we had to go down that road, it may not be a bad option. It could just be a possibility. I, you know, Alex and I talked about what that situation could be. It might be a student out on a long-term medical situation, perhaps, and that could be you know that might be another option as a as a best fit, um, but by entering into this resolution and agreement, we're not promising that we will partake. It just gives us the possibility, the ability. The ability. So it's it should be a um, I, and I sit on their I don't know what they call it their governing board or their board of directors, and we'll meet once a month just to kind of. Uh, and I'll be able to get updates and see kind of where this thing is going. Um, but it's it's just kind of neat that it's a local it's a local consortium that's um, providing good virtual education. So, how many spots would we get if we by by joining this? Right. How many spots? I don't know we? that they quantified that. Um, and as small as we are, chances are we're not going to have a problem getting in. Um, especially when we start talking about the high school, those classes can get fairly large. Elementary, I'm, I, I don't know their threshold, it's probably about you know 15 students or whatever to a class, to a virtual class. Um, I, I think, I, my assumption is that we wouldn't have a problem getting in should we have to go down that road. So we'll make a motion to approve yeah. this That's and we'll have discussion. That's okay. Yeah. I make a yeah. motion to approve the resolution of the Brentwood <laughs> Board of Education Intergovernmental Agreement for the operation of the St. Louis Virtual Campus Program. Second. Discussion. I have. Sorry. Yeah. No. So <laughs> what is the tuition cost going to be? Is it more than, has it said that the district will be responsible for the cost? Is it going to be more than the tuition that we set every year for our district, or do we know that yet? I, boy, I don't know off the top of my head, but I do know it's less than launch. So that was another um, contributing factor that the, um, this group really wanted to make sure it was competitive with launch to the fact that it would be actually less expensive than launch. Um, for uh, The elementary program has a pretty steep price tag because you're providing the entire child's education versus uh, launch, or in this case, once they're online, 
it's um, I'm going to say like 250 or 270 dollars a course for a high school student to take a course. Um, my assumption is that the St. Louis Virtual Academy or campus is going to keep that that even tighter than that. So it's either going to be cost neutral or if anything else, it'll be a benefit to a local school districts to participate. So we don't have to have a teacher rep. So, n so each one of these school districts doesn't provide a teacher no. rep. Parkway kind of takes over over that. They, they'll actually have a Parkway email address and uh, Parkway, they'll get on there. It's Parkway's kind of the, not only the fiscal, but kind of just the, the warehouse for it, for the whole county. Yeah. I guess I just, I'm not 100% familiar with launch, so I guess I just want to make sure. So let's say Parkway, no kids sign up for first grade, and we have someone that signs up for first grade. Is there teachers assigned specific? Like, how does it work with the teacher, you know, getting a so you know, like, do they have, like, yeah. 15 teachers sitting there waiting to teach virtually, and if no one shows up, they're eating the cost for it? Well, they wanted, I mean, well, yes and no. I mean, okay. they're, they're putting some kind of math behind this. They wanted to, they, they asked all schools over the summer, and even in last spring, you know, what is your participation? And at that point, we didn't have any students indicate any interest. But others, there's 22 school districts in the county, and um, my, from what I'm hearing is that yes, they'll have you know about 15 kids that from all over the county that will be in their own class, and they're even talking about doing stuff like going on a field trip to the sculpture park and doing a bowling event to where they can bring some community in a virtual setting. So, point is, 15 kids from all over the county might be in first grade, and one teacher will be assigned to that group even though they, they could live in Ferguson or in Eureka or here in Brentwood. It's, it's kind of a, an interesting concept, and that's the whole idea, too, is that they're trying to build a little bit of more of a community. In Springfield Launch, you could have a kid that lives in Kirksville or Maryville or Cape Girardeau, and it's, it's just not the same as having your own little kind of community that we have maybe the capacity to build here in St. Louis. I just was more, so there's a, it seems like there's enough desire around the community for them to have a teacher pay yes. for the teacher and not be and looking to yeah. the particip non-participating schools and say, you signed an agreement, we need you to kick, you know, like we've gone over our budget, you need to kick in. I, the no price is set, the tuition or whatever you want to yeah. call it, that's a set. That's a Once you pick a kid, if no kids go, there's no cost to it. Correct. Okay. If we were to have a child who was interested in it, but still wanted to come for music or for gym or for something like that, are we going to allow that or is it your launch or your not launch? And then, like going forward, because this is only elementary. If they start talking about high school, I'd be interested to find out like what is going to be like the setup if we do this at secondary level for sports for students. That gets into the whole <coughs> mocap discussion, and there is some talk about kind of loosening those restrictions. But right now, to participate in any kind of virtual education, the child has to be either enrolled in our district or a public school district in Missouri for the previous six months. Um, so that that helps make that determination whether a child can participate or not. Um, you know, working that hybrid schedule, we would have to almost take it on a, a case by case situation. And then Misha sets all the rules for sports. Yeah. So we just follow whatever guidelines they tell us to in terms of what seat time has to be or doesn't have to be, so. I mean, I think it's a great program and great concept. I think elementary, we, we've all said, you know, they suffered probably the most when it came to having to do virtual schooling. So, I mean, there are certain situations where this may be the only option, but, you know, not that I want to downplay it, but just, you know. That's what, I don't know that we would, it would, I, I, we couldn't yet actually think of a circumstance that it actually may apply, but it, it may, something may happen. Well, and the nice thing about it, too, is there, there are definitely some for-profit virtual companies that are coming into Missouri and they don't necessarily have the quality um, and the prices are high and they're very much targeting parents and communities throughout the state since we continue to you know, relax these rules around enrollment and who has to pay for virtual and so forth. So with programs like Launch and this, you know, we be assured that there's we're involved there's going to be some <coughs> quality to it there's there's not price gouging and profiteering taking place so I have one last question no one else does. is it just kind of similar to the PECS program like will all of their scores their grades and everything
still go under the Brentwood School District um, scores? Will they have to come in and take the additional standardized testing? You know, how is that piece? That is a good question. They'll, they will be required to take the assessments. Now, whether or not they are, in my assumption, and I'll look into it, my assumption is that we would still get their, they're still our students, mm -hmm. and so we would, um, we would get those test scores under our test reporting. Um, but let me verify. And then, Alex, so this wouldn't be something we advertise necessarily. It would just be if a student was presented with some circumstance or a parent was perhaps moving into the district and they were looking for alternative options besides a classroom right. setting, we could say we can offer this as a brand That is student. correct. It's, it, it's just another tool in our virtual toolbox. I mean, MOCAP is out there and we have policies that kind of dictate that. This would just be another approved vendor. This is another MOCAP provider. Yep. MOCAP. <clears throat> so, I was curious about the, uh, what is there, eight or nine districts that are signing on to this? Is, are there ones who didn't want to, or was this, was this, uh, uh, Parkway was the motivator behind this? Or Parkway was probably the biggest player, only because um, when we went to these kind of planning meetings, they, it was apparent that they had uh, the largest percentage of kids doing virtual education for whatever reason. And so they had a lot of these structures already in place, so it made a lot of sense, and they were willing to say, well, look, we kind of kind of already started building the house, so to speak, so if we wanted to just make it a little bigger and have other districts join in, um, that's, that's kind of, that was the impetus for it. Parkway kind of took the lead, and other school districts were kind of interested in having more of a local virtual pro product to offer our, our families. So is there any requirements from uh, Brentwood School District to provide, you know, internet access or computers in this? It's all system? handled through, it's all, it's all handled through Parkway. They'll get a, the child would receive like a, a device from Parkway, okay. it'll be a Parkway, um, they, they don't use Canvas, they use Schoology, so everything, <coughs> in a way it kind of almost feels like they're a Parkway student, but they're really not a Parkway student. Uh, so some, some district had to be kind of the gatekeeper. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, that's approved. Right. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Next up, <coughs> Mr. Norwood, we have our budget adjustment. Uh, as part of our uh, June 21st meeting, you all gave me the authority through action to provide for budget adjustment number two to our 21-22 budget year. Uh, this was to set our expenditures and uh, within our budget restrictions. We did not add any dollars to our total budget overall, and um, we did not add any adjustments to our revenues either. If you look at our summary, you'll see that every one of the costs on the recap page is completely zeroed out. So uh, it, you can see in the details where we moved those funds from, but we did not actually add any dollars to our budget overall. Uh, this item is not an action item. This is merely a summary and a detailed report of what we performed. Can I ask you a few questions? Sure. Surprise, surprise. Um, I just, there were some numbers that were kind of vastly different, and I guess I just it caught my eye when I was looking through it. The tuition reimbursement, we had budgeted 250 and budgeted Took it down to 19, so we had literally no, very few teachers took us up on the teacher reimbursement option during the year. Basically, we we anticipate a lot will, and then not many did. So throughout the year, we did move some of those funds, or a considerable amount of those funds, to fund other operations, and we did that at the uh, year end. Um, we typically we have reduced that amount to be much more in line with our historical factors for our 22 23 year. Okay. Uh, what is CS instructional services? So collaborative school district, um, there's a big group of codes that were part of the collab. Uh, this is the last year for the collaborative school district. So there are, this was basically cycling down the program. So there was dollars that were set aside for that program that could have been spent as part of the consortium. We are the, so we are, or were the custodial agent for the collaborative school districts to manage those funds. We take intuition from the participating school districts, and then we spent for that. That program uh, reduced a teacher's assistant this year, and then we also uh, spent less that this year because we knew the program was going to start as a basically shutting down. And then our food, obviously, I just the chart.
start wells, I know we have like a contract with, you know, with them, and the, we budgeted 300 and we ended up at 478. Was that them raising their cost? So we had or was that uh, just food cost through the roof? 15 factors. We had, uh, free, we had free lunches, free breakfast for all of our students for the last seven years. So last year, uh, we had approximately a 7% increase overall in the cost of uh, food products as just the consumer price index. We also had an increased participation in the program. So we served more meals and everything else. And I'm always impressed that you can just rattle this stuff off the top of the No, we set this all up beforehand to make him look really smart. <laughs> no, I'm joking. He knows all the stuff off the top of his head, so that's why I don't hesitate to ask. No. I honestly sit here and just jot notes down to try to say, okay, what is it that I can try to be prepared? Was <laughs> Keith going to ask you? Yeah, that's good. Those are big numbers. Those, they were just such big numbers. numbers. Yeah. I'm Those just glad we have a Keith who knows how to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. All right. The next uh, item up, I'm looking for action from the board to give us the ability um, to bid out and uh, pursue an additional vehicle for the district. We've identified the need in in recent <coughs> years in terms of specifically uh, shuttling uh, students uh, to various events and so forth. We, we often deal with, uh, in my conversations with Dr. Ayotte and Dr. Johnson, getting students to practices, for instance. We often have to, <coughs> as you know, in prior years we've utilized fields throughout you know, the Brentwood area since we have a very <coughs> small footprint and, you know, only one uh, field to utilize. So um, we often have to rely on, you know, our students, you know, driving themselves, walking, catching rides. And then there's also uh, been the issue that, uh, you know, while Vic provides transportation um, for uh, formal games, they do not provide transportation to a lot of the uh, so-called uh, voluntary components of being on a team, uh, such as you know summer workouts, which you know if any of your uh, any of your sons or daughters have been involved in sports, you know that while it's voluntary, it's a very big part of getting ready for the season. Um, so that's placed uh, quite a hardship on our big families and being able to try to get their students to that or many of our big students just then unfortunately can't participate in that summer preparation. So after, after talking at length with uh, between you know, maintenance and uh, facilities, working with Dr. Ayat and Dr. Johnson and conversations with uh, Matt and myself, um, we feel the best option to meet those needs would be a 15-person uh, transit van. Um, that would give us the ability, it, uh, we would be able to um, get various people the ability to drive that because it doesn't require um, a CDL license in order to do that, like, you know, for instance, a, a bus would. Um, we'll have space to accommodate it easy to work on, limited mileage, we feel we could keep this for a lot of years. Um, Matt, why don't you just kind of briefly talk to the process
function to go out to bid for the 15th passenger for Transit Connect? Second. Discussion? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, is this a, for a brand new yes. vehicle then? And that would be covered under warranty for whatever Ford's warranty is, yes. 100,000 miles. Mm -hmm. okay. So this would be a new vehicle, this would be a 2022. Uh, the, the option for us to build and start the bid process opened yesterday. Um, we would be in somewhat of a compressed timeline, so we would bidding relatively quickly and trying to bring back the results for our next board meeting. That way we can get in on the production timeline. Uh, as many people are aware, everything is in short supply and everybody wants it. So what Ford has done right now is they have a window open for the orders. Whenever they meet their ex uh, anticipated capacity, they're going to close it. So um, our, our intention is to get into that window. Yeah. And we don't really have an anticipated timeline necessarily. I mean, probably six months. We don't have an anticipated delivery date. Okay, so yeah, that was going to be my next our, my next question. What's the lead time? Then? That's a that's a guess at this point. Obviously, yeah. as we got deeper into it, we'll keep, <coughs> we would keep the board mm -hmm. updated on that. But we all know with the automotive issues that, um, and also with these vans, for instance, you know sometimes. This isn't the most, you know, they can make more money if they can sell them to a, uh, you know, someone outside of that process, but we'd we're like to get in line. We're currently still pushing for a vehicle that we ordered in February. So yeah, we truck. a truck that was ordered in February. Wow. It has not hit the production line yet, mm -hmm. but they have not canceled our order yet. New trucks aren't scheduled for orders until October. So right now we just got into the window for the vans uh new truck production is anticipated for october and we're still pushing back right now mm -hmm. okay. Do you have a question? yeah i have a couple questions so i'll just rattle them off and then sure. whoever uh, generally speaking who's going to be driving the van you know uh, have we thought about the overall cost to insure the van the extra insurance for are there going to be cost savings from not paying for other transportation because we now have it's an in-house? Um, how do we decide who gets to ride in the 15-passenger van? Because most sporting, most sports teams have more than 15 people on them. So if we're sitting here and saying, "Hey, we'll drive you guys from the school to practice and back," how do we decide which 15 kids get to hop in? And you know, I guess that's a kind of that's my concern is that not getting the van, but is it going to be enough, you know, for all the kids to be, you know, because it's not going to be big enough to take kids on field trips. It's not going to be big enough, you know. It, it's kind of seemed like a very limited sports use is really what we're talking about on it. And I guess I'm just looking at the overall <coughs> cost to the district even after we spend the $50,000 to have the proper insurance. And we're going to have to pay people to drive the bus after hours and things like that that I want to kind of think about. Kind of a bunch of yeah, questions. Yeah, of course, yeah. A, a couple things. One, yeah. this would, yes, this is absolutely going to be a supplement and not to supplant. There would be, uh, you know, there are times right now, though, where we do rent vans very similar to this when we go to, you know, wrestlers go to state tournaments, for instance, you know, and the, and the coaches drive them down there. So there will be some cost off offset, but I'm not pitching this as, as revenue neutral. This is not going to save us money. This is going to be an additional service that we could offer our students. Who would be driving it? What we envision is, um, you know, we could have some, you know, extra duty personnel that were available. Yeah, there would have to be a cost per hour associated with that. I think many of our coaches um, would be willing to do it and you know we could put a you know a small additional cost around that as well um, but I think they would be glad to do it um, a lot of our our we do have several teams at the Brentwood School District though that are 15 students are less that we could utilize when you talk about you know you might look at the, you know the girls tennis team boys tennis team um, where we've had you know, field hockey, we've had a variety of different teams that are doing that. No, absolutely, this wouldn't be like, hey, we can take the football team to a to a game. We're still going to be renting uh, multiple buses.
classes as we always have. So this would just be a, a, a supplement to what we can currently do. And I guess a follow up with what's going on with our capital budget and Mark Twain, I guess what is our plan? Like, you know, we're trying to figure out the, the capital budget to make sure that we can afford everything at Mark Twain. Where is this $50,000 coming from, I guess, on our long-term capital budget? So we're going to include this cost as part of our projections, which we are working on as part of the additional resources that are going for anticipated to be included in the Mark Twain project. Um, we, are, we are expecting those projections to be done by the end of the week and reportable to the Finance Committee. So the board would also, if that's a concern, Keith, you could also wait to the meeting of the, our next meeting of the Finance Facilities Committee, which will have updated uh, projections that include Mark Twain expenses on there. I mean, I, I would just assume get the bid, get the bid, and then start worrying about how we're going to pay for it once we, you know, we have a tight window here. At least my, this myself. Yeah, I don't, I this doesn't commit us to anything. It just burns up Matt's time doing it, and then we figure out from there how we're going to pay for it. It's true. Yeah, this is solely a request for proposal. We have policy and we have procedure that says that we can deny all bids. So if this is something that's outside of our budget limitations. And we do not get a notice to proceed, then this comes no. A couple of things. Um, so, one thing as far as I think one of the reasons we came to this is you know, we've had buses not show. There's a huge shortage of bus drivers. There was just something the other day about how several city schools for X amount of time is not even going to be able to provide buses to some of their children. You know, we've had situations where we share buses. Dr. or Dr. Ayot, I almost said Dr. Steve, Dr. Ayot is very creative, gets very creative, shares buses, we go back, we go forth. Um, kids have had to leave instructional time 50 minutes to an hour early because we had to take buses when we could. If we can keep kids in a classroom because we have these bands that could take them, I think that's a huge thing. We've had teachers have to leave early if they're coaching and so then that's a substitute that comes in. Um, so there's, there's different things that have led to this. It's been a discussion for at least three to five years. I'm excited that we're here and we're having this discussion. Um, we also have had situations where we've had big children need rides home. Um, and so this could be something that could get them home and so on and so forth. Something I was curious about is back in the day when we had driver's ed, we would look at dealerships, we would look at enterprise and things like that and see if they would be willing to donate. I don't know if that is even something to consider, but we have a lot of parents that work for Enterprise in our, in our district. Um, we are a school district that maybe an Enterprise would be interested in doing something like that. I don't know if that's something that we can do or if there's something that says we can't, but I think it's something to look into. If we could get one of those entities that would be interested in doing something and helping us get that ban and know why we're needing it and so on and so forth. I think it's a door we should try and open as well as you know continue to bid. But I mean, why not? We can ask. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the odds Even are. Even dealerships <laughs> too. I mean, some yeah. dealerships have done that. Now maybe we get a used one versus a new one, and maybe we need to weigh that pro and con. But maybe we get a used one where we're trying to figure out, you know, like he said, where are the different money's coming from, and then we look at this once we're done with Mark Twain at an a new one or something but I think we should you know look at look at that and just see if oh, anybody well, buys last couple we don't mind asking um, in terms of the used overall <coughs> the used versus new we did consider that <coughs> we, we looked at you know we did look at some used online and so forth but as we all know the price of used vehicles is ridiculous right now and then when you look at the way we would take care of it and the relatively low miles and the fact that we can go through, you know, this bidding process through the state, I think we're much better served to get a, to get a new vehicle. Yeah, one, just a couple other things that I thought this could be used for besides sports. Our, de our debate and robotics teams are pretty small and they go to weekend tournaments. So Absolutely. this would be a great way for us to have control over that <coughs> transportation. And staff aren't using their own cars if they need to, to get around with these kids. So, so yeah. that's another good benefit. It'll be safe. It'll be safety inspected by you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we'd probably write up a policy on allowable uses mm -hmm. and 
because I just don't, you know, if it's late at night, just because someone lives in the district, they could, you know, maybe they shouldn't be walking home at nine o'clock at night, you know, like just because you're outside the district, I, I just wouldn't want the car to be only, the vehicle to only be for, you know, I'd want the policy to be written up that only certain kids can, can use the, you know, if there's a late play practice and someone has the van to drop all the kids off at home, it seems like a, a good use. I just want to make sure, you know, we'd have some sort of policy in place that Absolutely. Yeah. dictate driving. Yeah, we would have to talk about, they have policies out there, we just haven't had to have one, but yes, it talks about, you know, who can drive the vehicle and who has to be in the vehicle, you know, that you're not going to have one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera, et cetera. So. More forms for Dr. Chambers to come. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, any more questions for Matt or Dr. Lane? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that's approved. Thank you, Matt. That's all I had. Okay, so that moves us into Board of Education, Missouri Ethics Resolution. Motion to approve the Missouri Ethics Commission Conflict of Interest Resolution. Have a second. Oh, second. Okay. All right. Uh, discussion. This is something we do annually. It's no major changes from last year. Anything like that. All right. Any questions? Any comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's approved. And we have one policy to approve. Yeah, it's just every two years, the uh, financial conflict of interest and financial disclosure. Mm -hmm. Motion to approve policy BBFA. Second. Discussion? Make sure you get it turned in on time because I literally got fined last year because I thought I turned it in. So they will find you if you do not turn it on time. <laughs> Good to know. Okay. It's Can like you, $50 I, dollars or something like did that. Did we fill these out when we were applying? Like, yeah. But I think, like, am I qualified or do I need to do yeah. another one? Everybody has to do it annually, but if you're, the, uh, if you're running for school board, you're doing it when you're running for school board. Okay. So I guess so my question guess is, do I need to redo it? Do I need to do this one or? They'll send it to you. They'll, they'll okay. send it via mail. Send yeah, mind. okay, I got it. Yeah, I ran. Yeah, I this out. was the, this was the year that I ran, but I still got it. Yeah. I have to turn it in. Like it's sitting in my things to do right yeah. now. So <laughs> even though I ran, I still yeah, got it. it. So you would have gotten it the last <laughs> month. Yeah, the last month. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't trust my wife. I came from it. The, <laughs> the other thing too is if you are on the board, you know, and then April comes in, you're not running again or whatever, and so then you're no longer on the board. Or April, you still have to file for that previous year. Oh. Does anyone know if there's somewhere online to look? I have not gotten anything in the mail. So. Well, you can, there's a number you can call. I'll look at it and okay. I'll send it to you. Yeah. Um, because I swore I sent it and they had no recollection. So you might even want to send it certified. So you have a receipt. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, all in <coughs> favor for approving policy BBFA. Uh, Say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That's approved. That moves us into the MSBA delegate report. Any news? Then there's the annual conference coming up in November, I believe, and if anyone is interested in going to that, they can let Kate know. She takes care of all of the registration and lodging details for us. And I need some lodging information from you about where you want to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I can make a reservation. Got it. I will. Thank you. So who I is think she already signed me up. Okay. Yeah. You're taking care of Brian's going to take Okay. I will send and it to you. And this is one for November? Because yeah, they're right now doing some special for early. I saw you get that. 10 people to go uh -huh. from your district. There's a deal. That's a little, a little excessive for us. <laughs> yeah. We could take the van. Yeah, oh, yeah right. <laughs> it's not going to be here until February. We can, tell you, we can tell you yes now. Right. We can test and if yes. we had to cancel, we could or not? Um, yeah, if you could cancel, there's a cancellation date that's coming up pretty soon. I want to do it, but I just don't know about college visits right now. Yeah, I would say if anyone is interested and able to do it, you they're they're pretty great in terms of being able. There are a lot of options for um, different discussions and presenters. Kansas City's great. It's good. And Brian will line up some place to put it in there. I'm like a concierge. 
<laughs> fabulous. Okay. Um, and then board committee updates. Uh, I don't believe any of our committees have met since our retreat where we did do some brainstorming on goals for this year. Correct me if I'm wrong or if anyone has any updates. Okay. Um, upcoming events. I guess the only thing, so yes, this, there is a school safety summit and the conference uh, the first week of November. So those are what Kate needs from us. Otherwise, we have motion. a motion to adjourn. Motion, to motion for adjournment and motion, or motion for adjournment and to close session. Second. All right, if we could have a roll call, please, Kate.